A Year of American Literature. In this, the second quarter of American literature, we're going to be comparing the Romantics to the era of realism and regionalism. First, a bit about the worst picnic in the history of the world. The people in this photo had just come out from Washington, D.C. to observe the Battle of Bull Run, the first battle of the Civil War. The spectators showed up with a picnic lunch of sandwiches and opera glasses, kind of small binoculars. Pure romantics. Within a few hours, these spectators were retreating as refugees from a battle. Then there was artillery and cavalry and poorly trained troops panicked and ran from the battlefield. The spectators' amusing summer outing turned into chaos. It might be fair to say that this was the day American Romanticism died. Before the American Civil War, war was represented to the common folk by paintings or illustrations, and it all looked pretty heroic. Suddenly, the camera was invented. The reality of war was stripped naked and shown to the public. The Civil War changed more than politics in America. After the Civil War, people weren't much interested in reading about the war hero. They had seen the brutality and the mental distress. They had lived the filthy outdoor life and experienced the sheer boredom of war. People who had lived the real thing couldn't stomach the overactive imaginations of writers who had lived their entire lives behind desks. All that moping about the eerie and the mysterious went right out the window. They wanted something real. During the Romantic era, Herman Melville and Washington Irving lived right in New York City. Nathaniel Hawthorne and Thoreau lived in Massachusetts. James Fenimore Cooper resided in upstate New York and Harriet Beecher Stowe lived in Connecticut. All of these authors came from the Northeast, except Edgar Allan Poe, who came from Maryland, the northernmost and easternmost of the southern states. They all lived within a few hundred miles of each other. They were also all white and all of them were male, except Harriet Beecher Stowe. In this era, we're going to see people from all across the United States. We're gonna see more females. We're gonna see blacks, Native Americans, Westerners. Before and during the Civil War, people didn't want to talk or read much about different regions of the country. Our problems were firmly rooted in the North, the South, and what to do with the West. After, with regional tensions gone, people wanted to read about different places around the country. And since they were interested in different regions, this was called regionalism. Southerners read about the North, and Northerners read about the South. And most of all, the favorite topic was the West. New lands were opening up out there and people were headed out there. Folks back east loved to read about it. The excitement and the action of the Western hero appealed to many people. The Romantics portrayed natives' lives as exciting and exotic and the hardships were downplayed. Because they lived closely to nature, Romantics assumed they would have been more honest and more pure. But remember, these writers lived in the very settled Northeast and had little contact with natives. What they wrote came from their reading and from their imaginations. With the realists, stories about Native Americans spotlight the hardships, 
and the stories are often true ones. The experience of Euro-Americans with the natives are no longer the romantic, romanticized relationships portrayed by James Fenimore Cooper. People like to read about characters experiencing nature but this fairy tale, awe-inspiring nature, was gone. Nature still dominated the characters, but unlike this romanticized image, realists saw nature as overwhelming, destructive, impersonal force. Nature didn't care about you. They didn't care about whether you lived or died. It couldn't be for you or against you. Romantics saw the individual as powerful, but the realists had seen the foolish and the unlucky find themselves at the mercy of nature. Look at this boat, a human creation. The, it's useless. The mast and the rudder are broken and gone. Sharks surround him. A water spout, a water tornado looms in the background. Huck Finn, an impoverished young man, runs away and is joined by the runaway slave Jim. In their various adventures, Huck must question the institution of slavery. Why it's a book of realism and regionalism. The story takes place in the Old South on the Mississippi River, an area outside the centers of power. Huck, Jim, and the other characters speak in local dialects. Tom Sawyer, in his love for silly adventure, clearly represents the Romantics. The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane. The novel's the internal conflicts of a young man approaching battle for the first time and wondering whether he will have courage. Why it's realism and regionalism. It sets out to destroy the myth of the war hero. It includes realistic and historically accurate battle scenes. It focuses on the complex internal struggle of its main character rather than on the battle itself. It portrays the psychological effects of fear. It portrays nature as indifferent. It includes dialect. Narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. The text details the true events of the life of the former slave that escaped to become a prominent activist, author, and public speaker. Why it's a book of realism and regionalism? Douglas was in touch with reality and focused on showing life for what it really was. While he did show some qualities deemed romantic, he never softened the blow of his harsh words for the unsuspecting reader. Douglas spoke his mind and didn't care who he offended. The Call of the Wild by Jack London, a domestic dog leading a cushy life in California is kidnapped or dognapped and sold into the sled dog market in the Yukon. Why it's a book of realism and regionalism. London portrays the harshness of the far north. It takes place in the far north, a new place and exciting for its readers. The novel portrays nature as indifferent. The novel portrays the actions and customs of people of the far north. The Awakening by Kate Chopin. In Louisiana, at the end of the 19th century, Edna Pontellier struggles between the prevailing social attitudes of the American South and her increasingly unorthodox views on femininity and motherhood. Why it's realism. It focuses on women's issues without condescension. It takes place in the American South far from the centers of power. The novel centers on ordinary people leading ordinary lives. Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. The story follows the lives of the four March sisters, detailing their passage from childhood to womanhood. It's loosely based on the lives of the author and her three sisters. Why it's a book of realism and regionalism. Although sometimes didactic and sentimental, the novel never sacrifices its realism. It's set during and after the Civil War. The character's mentor encourages her to abandon fantasy and develop deeper writing by using realism. The main character marries an older, boring professor, and the heartthrob character, 
who many readers expected, marries the least likable sister. How the Other Half Lives, Studies Among the Tenements of New York by Jacob Rees. It was a pioneering work of photojournalism. It served as a basis for future muckraking journalism. Why it's a book of realism. It documented the squalid living conditions in New York City slums in the 1880s, exposing the slums to New York City's upper and middle classes. And there were, of course, others. Many of the most important books of the late 1800s were not written in America. Charles Darwin was the most popular writer in English, the Russians were hitting their peak. Z Thus spake Zarathustra and the Origin of Species were among the most important nonfiction books written. The outlook of the origins of species proved scientifically the harshness of nature, the br brutal aspect of the selection process. Overall, the realists found the world a much harder place than the optimistic romantics did.